Hey, this is DQP coming to you before the video. This video comes with a few content warnings. Of course, I'm going to start seriously spoiling the plot of 13 Sentinels about four minutes into the essay. And there's going to be discussions of topics like nationalism, fascism, gaslighting, homophobia, and transphobia. 13 Sentinels is a fantastic game that I wouldn't hesitate to recommend if you can stomach those content warnings but it is admittedly not always graceful in tackling a lot of this subject matter. I think that this game has interesting things to say, but I'm not going to say that it is perfect or that it's without some pretty heavy problems. And we'll get to that. So, without further ado. One of my favorite movies growing up was The Matrix. I was introduced to it as a formative teenager, and it provoked serious thought in a way that few movies did for me back then. It was a film about feeling trapped, and the desire no, need, to break free from the restraints that society places us under. Labels and expectations all acted as subtextual chains that kept Neo in line, and it was by accepting his truest self that he was able to break free. That kind of story resonated with me as a teenager. It's a hard film not to resonate with. I'm sure that we've all felt imprisoned in some form or another by societal expectations, if not literally by corrupt leaders. And yes, to get this out of the way, The Matrix is a story written by two transgender women. It is not a subtle allegory, nor does it need to be subtle. As mentioned in my Watchmen video, subtlety is for chumps. I think history has been remarkably great to this movie. The Matrix is a cathartic watch. It's a story of a crew who struggles and struggles against this cage that the powers that be have constructed around them. And not only do they break free, they make the cage their own and bend it to their will. Neo becomes the master of his own identity, the master of how others see him, and the master of himself. It was hard to watch that story as a teenager and not envy that a little bit. Let's put a pin in that. 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim was considered a dark horse pick for many publications' best of 2020 lists, including my own. It's divided into three different segments. Remembrance, which is a Tarantino-esque, time-skipping, multi-protagonist visual novel. Destruction, which is a tower defense-ish, RTS-ish thing, which, if I'm being honest, is a little clunky and hard to follow. And Analysis, which is a built-in wiki recapping all of the information you've collected so far. Side note, having a built-in in-game codex slash wiki is a fantastic feature, and every game with a lengthy story should include one. I know it's kind of a no-duh feature for many games, but being able to recap where you are in a story is really helpful for busy adult game players like myself. The heart of the game is in that Remembrance visual novel, which has 13 protagonists that you shift between at regular intervals. You can choose which parts of the story to experience based on your own curiosity, though the game does put up locks to make sure you don't get ahead of yourself or get overwhelmed. Playing a visual novel with 13 playable characters may sound intimidating, but it's a remarkably easy rabbit hole to fall into, and untangling the game's giant knot is an enjoyable way to spend 40-ish hours. Even though I was able to choose different protagonists at different intervals, the pacing remained so tight that I was on the edge of my seat for the majority of the game. The RTS segments are not that great, and they suffer from being both a bit obtuse and also having a wildly inconsistent difficulty curve, but you know what? They aren't that important. I did not decide to write a lengthy video essay about a mediocre tower defense game, I wanted to write about this game's story, and specifically three of this game's stories, Juro Karabe, Takatoshi Hijiyama, and Tomi Kisaragi. I'm going to get into the weeds with these stories, and yes, this is the part where I'm going to start spoiling this game, so let's go! Juro Karabe is trapped by the entertainment he consumes. Th that's not an exaggeration. 426 is slowly rewriting his memories in an attempt to assimilate Karabe into his own Juro Izumi persona, using old movie tapes to do so. 426 isn't even the only party involved in this. Morimura and Yakushiji are both complicit in this as well. Yakushiji spends most of her arc making a deal with a cat-shaped devil figure to grant a wish to save the one she loves, while being tasked to fight witches, and Yakushiji is voiced by Christina V in the English dub, and I get it, this ain't a subtle reference. Karabe leads a comfortable existence, even after 426 hops into his nanomachines. His troubling dreams, that is, Izumi's memories, are recontextualized to seem like pop entertainment. 
the kaiju, the sentinel, the androids, the universal control terminal, even the violent shootouts and massacres of innocent lives are all made to seem like that one movie or that one TV show. This happens even when other students show concern for him, trying to urge him towards the truth of what's really going on in his head. It's easy for him to brush that truth off as probably just the result of all that schlock he watches late at night. He winds up sounding like me whenever a political headline reminds me even slightly of a Simpsons gag. Like seriously, Sideshow Bob Roberts is absolutely uncanny to watch in 2021. Go watch it and I guarantee you'll get chills anyway. 426 spends the vast majority of Karabe's arc gaslighting him into thinking that his attempts to basically nort him are nothing more than dreams resembling the pop entertainment he consumes, and Karabe freely buys into it. It takes 426 almost no effort whatsoever to convince Karabe that he's been a longtime friend, and that they've spent years gushing over their favorite cheesy sci-fi shows and movies, and hey, what's so weird about hiding a body? You never hid a body before in your life? Granted, a lot of that isn't necessarily because Karabe is weak-willed or predisposed to gaslighting because of memory problems, though his time in Sentinel No. 13, combined with all the drugs Murray Murr has given him, probably doesn't help much in that regard. 13 Sentinels takes place in a world where nanomachines in people's brains make memories easily manipulatable or erasable. Karabe himself is an artificial personality, constructed by Morimura and the Tamao Karabe AI after Izumi's multiple sentinel battles in sectors 2 and 3 left his memories battered and husk-inducing. Juro Karabe is relaxed and compliant, a far cry from Izumi's radical actions from a loop ago. 426 and the entertainment he provides Karabe offer him the illusion of a cozy existence while 426 does his work. And I'm sure that by now you've remembered the title of this video and probably assumed the fairly obvious and insidious context that I might be going here, that we're all like Karabe and that our entertainment is a comfortable prison while an awful elite brainwashes us for their own profit, and yeah, 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 bada bing, bada boom, mesmerize the simple-minded. Yeah, actually, that's not quite my point. If you look at Karabe's story as a straight metaphor for the entertainment industry, it's full of holes. Like, it isn't inaccurate to say that Karabe is being norted by the entertainment he consumes, but on the one hand, what he's consuming isn't real in-universe entertainment, it's an AI recontextualizing his own dreams as mindless popcorn entertainment. They ain't exactly comfortable dreams. And on the other, this is all morally complicated because 426's goals are actually pretty noble at heart? His means are reprehensible, but his ends seem reasonable. He wants to stop the Daimos just like everybody else. He and Karabe part before the final battle on surprisingly good terms, with 426 trusting Juro to exist as Juro Karabe, with Izumi's memories, as he fights for humanity. But the Our Entertainment Keeps Us Trapped subtext is still there, a little bit. The 13 Chosen Ones are all trapped in a simulation that is based, in part, on a video game. Like, that's why the destruction segments are so overtly gamey. They're literally based on a video game that Okino enjoyed back in 2188. 426 even continually refers to the final battle as such near the end. But Project Arc's engineers did not intend for this simulation to be a prison, not like in the Matrix. The simulation in 13 Sentinels is meant to culturally incubate the 13 as they grow from infants to young adults, before giving them the truth at age 20 and letting them go. And it technically goes as planned. Barely. The 13 grow up well versed in the different cultures spread throughout the sectors. Juro and his fellow classmate Shu Amiguchi are submerged in 80s pop entertainment by the time the audience enters the story. And even Tomi Kisaragi is able to acknowledge the popular 20 to 40 year nostalgia cycle theory when she travels back to 1985. One of Project Arc's engineers literally states the importance of this at the end of the game. Together. And that's a neat, heartwarming thesis to wrap the game up on. That though we shouldn't abandon our responsibilities to keep the human race going, we also shouldn't abandon the arts, culture, and knowledge that makes humanity unique. 
It proposes an ideal happy medium between living our lives and reveling in that culture. But You may have noticed that I've made a lot of pop cultural jokes in this segment. The Simpsons gag, the Kingdom Hearts campiness, the Homer Akemi callout, the propaganda leaves us blinded. And it's a little bizarre that that's just my sense of humor. That's a lot of people's senses of humor nowadays. Pointing at a thing and saying, hey, it's just like that other thing. And I get it, a part of what I do on YouTube is analyzing entertainment, and that often means comparing it to other entertainment. And I'm not saying that that can't be valuable or funny, but it makes me feel a little close-minded when it happens for the sixth time in a single segment of a single video. Nostalgia is a real scientifically studied phenomenon that targets the reward center of your brain, and many big companies know how to exploit that. Here, I'll show you. Did you get chills? If you're a 30-something 90s kid, I bet you did. And companies that make or approve PlayStation merchandise can count on that. Sony often markets itself as a legacy company with a long and illustrious lineage of classic prestige game consoles. They want you to associate that kind of feeling with the small innocuous stuff like startup sounds or controller layout. Or if you're under 30, There you go, same principle. I'm not trying to guilt trip you for appreciating nostalgic media. It gives me the warm fuzzies just like it does for everyone else, and there are many works of entertainment that use this phenomenon to do something genuinely interesting. 13 Sentinels is one. It uses a lot of schlocky, nostalgic 80s tropes to deliberately get a lot of these philosophical ideas across. I also think of works like Shovel Knight, which combines tons of different NES-era tropes to create something that feels like a definitive and authentic celebration of that era. Or Blade Runner 2049, which deliberately explores how those in power use wistful nostalgia to control those below them, while also being a sequel to an old nostalgic 80s movie. But for every positive example of entertainment that does this, I also think of all the ways that people have used it either as a cheap cash grab, or as a way to sell mediocre movie tickets, or even push forward a white fascist agenda. It's no coincidence that Trump pushed his campaign on making America great again. He wants voters to remember not the truth of what previous decades were like, but what they seemed to be. What people remember them positively as, or to be honestly specific, what white people remember them positively as. And it's through that lens that seeing Karabe and Izumi's story as a metaphor makes more sense. Nostalgia is a complicated psychological phenomenon that is easy to exploit. Our culture makes us who we are, yes, and we shouldn't downplay the value of our arts and our entertainment. But people in power know how to use nostalgia against you, and they're not afraid to do it for their own gain. The following two statements are simultaneously paradoxically true. 1. Takatoshi Hijiyama is a fascist who believes that same-sex attraction is immoral. And 2. Hijiyama is attracted to Tsukasa Okino even after his gender fluidity is revealed to him. Hijiyama was raised in the era of Showa statism, an era of rising nationalism and fascism. Okay, technically speaking, he was raised in a virtual facsimile of Showa statism, but what I'm saying still applies. To oversimplify things, this was an era where the Empire of Japan leaned very heavily on expansionism, militarism, and nationalist pride for Japanese traditions. Hey, remember what I was just saying about nostalgia? There is a lot more to understand about how Japan came to embrace these ideologies, and the history of Showa statism is long and complicated and often kind of terrifying. Japan did some pretty heinous stuff in this era of history. 2188 Keitaro Miura looked at this era with fascination, blissfully unaware that historic cool zones are just as unpleasant to actually live in as they are fun to read about. And it's in this simulation of Showa statism that the story's present day Takatoshi Hijiyama was transplanted and raised under. Hijiyama, along with present Miura, are young men filled with pride for their country. They will fight to the bitter end for their empire. 
And it is thus made awkward when the object of Hijiyama's affections, one Tsukasa Okino, turns out not to be the professor's daughter, but a time-traveling gender-fluid mastermind. I have a lot of complicated feelings about the relationship between Hijiyama and Okino. The original 2188 versions of Hijiyama and Okino were unambiguously in a loving romantic relationship, with 2188 Okino's true gender remaining about as fluid as it is within the simulation. The complication that the simulation brings to this is that Sim Hijiyama was raised under Showa fascism, which brings with it some fundamental changes to Hijiyama's worldview and character development. In Umberto Eco's 1995 essay, Ur Fascism, Eco listed off 14 telltale patterns of thinking that demonstrate a growing fascist sentiment. While I'm going to abridge and paraphrase a lot of this, and I'm not going to list all of them, I do think everyone should read this essay in full, especially if you're following the news or doom-scrolling political Twitter out of anxiety for where our country is going. I've linked it in the description. Among the patterns that pertain to Takatoshi Hijiyama are Number 10. Elitism is a typical aspect of any reactionary ideology insofar as it is fundamentally aristocratic, and aristocracy and militaristic elitism cruelly implies contempt for the weak. The citizens of a fascist state are the best people in the world, and the members of the fascist party are the best of those people. And though every citizen can and should become a member of the party, not everyone is strong enough for whatever duties the party requires. These people are weak and deserve to be ruled. Number 11. In such a perspective, everyone is educated to become a hero. In a fascist ideology, heroism is considered normal instead of exceptional. This is, in the words of Eko, linked with a cult of death. While most of us are rationally afraid of death and usually train to face it with dignity, a heroic fascist yearns for a heroic death, to die for country and for heroism. This puts themselves, and often others, at deadly risk. No! I am awaited! I am awaited in Valhalla! Number 12. Since both permanent war and heroism are difficult games to play, the Ur fascist transfers his will to power to sexual matters. To quote Eiko, this is the origin of machismo, which implies both disdain for women and intolerance and condemnation of non standard sexual habits, from chastity to homosexuality. And most fascinating to 13 Sentinels setting in general, number 13. <laughs> Ur fascism is based upon a selective populism, a qualitative populism, one might say. In a democratic system, citizens have individual rights, with a quantitative majority making decisions for the whole. However, in a fascist state, individuals have no rights whatsoever, and the will of the people is something that is interpreted by their leader. Because of this, quote, the people, end quote, is only a theatrical role that citizens play instead of an actual force guiding the fate of a nation. We'll get to that last one in the next section. Sim Hijiyama, and to a slightly lesser extent Sim Miura, are raised under the belief that Japan is the greatest empire in the world, and that they are willing to die for that. But this leads to what is, on paper, a delicious narrative conundrum. That even after Okino's gender is revealed to Hijiyama, his attraction to him still lingers. His fascist upbringing and his feelings for Okino are in direct conflict with one another, and he often sees his attraction as something that he has to suppress, or as something that can't possibly be real. Don't tell me. You were jealous. I... of course not. That's a juicy character tidbit, and I was excited to see how the game could use it to critically explore Hijiyama's fascist worldview. After all, a core thematic focal point of the game is the confluence of the natural with the artificial. The fascist world that Hijiyama grows up in, while based on Japanese history, is still ultimately not real. Like Juro Karabe's tapes, it's a virtual construct, nothing more than an idea, and not reality in and of itself. Fascism is like gender expectations, or Hollywood trends, or GameStop stocks. It's only real because enough powerful people say it is, and expect people to go along with it. And by contrast, his crush on Okino is based in reality. His body is having real chemical reactions and arousals when he sees or thinks about or is around Okino, regardless of how he's presenting at the time. And this is all based on the real-world relationship that Hijiyama and Okino had in 2188. 
those feelings are still there, and they present yet another angle from which the game tackles this conflict between the real and the virtual. Unfortunately, while the implications of this are fascinating to think about, the game ultimately flounders around this internal conflict. I can't say with any honesty that I'm a fan of the dynamic between Hijiyama and Okino, where Okino playfully keeps secrets from Hijiyama and, knowing how Hijiyama feels, manipulates him to do what he wants. Okino has power over Hijiyama, and he's not afraid to use it. He knows what buttons to push in order to make Hijiyama's conflicted fascist brain do what needs to be done, and to me at least, that's more than a little uncomfortable. And again, this is muddled by the idea that, like 426, Okino's intentions are also pretty noble. He wants to stop the kaiju same as everyone. But pair Okino's means with someone who's been so brainwashed into a self-destructive nationalist ideology that he considers his own genuine sexual attraction to be his own enemy, and you have a romantic pairing that's just fertile ground for toxicity and abuse. So is it good that while every other couple gets squared away by the end of the game, Hijiyama gets pretty forcefully paired with a woman he barely knows at that point, who's a clone, while still getting sexually teased by Okino, who uh, apparently can have any genitals now? I honestly don't know whether to condemn this as sudden het washing, or to praise this as Hijiyama getting away from an abusive situation. And neither choice speaks well to the game's representation of non-heteronormative sexualities or genders. It leaves Hijiyama's arc feeling like a gigantic missed opportunity. But I guess as long as he has his yakisoba pawn, one must imagine him happy. Alright, we should probably unpin that last Ur fascism bit we pinned a little while ago. Ur fascism, as quoted before, is based on a selective populism. The people becomes not a genuine political force, but rather just an act. To the policymakers, leaders, and enforcers in an Ur fascist society, the people may as well not exist as a factor for decision making. And this becomes fascinating as it pertains to 13 Sentinels, because in the world of 13 Sentinels, the people aren't real. And that's not metaphorical. The only humans who actually exist in the game's present day are the 13 chosen ones in their pods. Everyone else, from Morimura, to Ida, to Miwako, to Inaba, to the giant throngs of people running from the Daimos, they're all just data. They're numbers on a computer. In some cases, like with the multiple Morimoras or with Ida, they're versions of themselves from previous loops that used to be one of the 13, but because of some plot contrivances relating to Sector Zero and how loops work, they're stuck in the simulation same as the rest of the AIs. Chihiro is able to evacuate the city by basically dragging and dropping them into a different folder. That's how little power these people have. They are but actors in a play. A character will say something to them and their data will output a simulated response. Sometimes that data is based on real memories, but even for Ida or Morimura, or even for Okino, it's just that. Data. And I could go on a big sci-fi nerd rant and ask about whether an AI is truly human in this scenario or not, but that's not what I wanted to get at. And for the purposes of my point, we're just going to assume that the answer is yes, because they can feel pain and remorse and confusion just the same as anyone. And at the end of the game, the 13 plan on building physical bodies for them anyway, what I wanted to get at is that in an Ur-Fascist society, where a people are less than a people, just a facade of what they would be in a non-fascist state, those in power are a lot more inclined to abuse these people as tools and or, usually and, the system invites sociopaths into power because it rewards their sociopathy. So enter Tetsuya Ida. Ida has been trying to reconstruct the Tomi Kisaragi he loves for ages, and he will do anything to get her back. Not even short of torturing 426. He even expresses regret at one point that he didn't outright override the present loop's Kisaragi with the previous loop's Kisaragi. Ida is so desperate to bring her back that he is willing to induce another loop, or at least try to, erasing everything and everyone and rebuilding them from scratch. And he doesn't let anyone stop him. Not even Tomi Kisaragi, who's working behind his back to wake the 13 up before the Daimos induce a reset. Kisaragi, as Inaba, pleads and makes her case to Ida before he shoves her aside just like he does with everyone else. I can see Ida's sociopathic logic. 
if he can just reset the timeline and reconstruct everything and transplant people's consciousnesses or memories into other people or androids, even other people, real people, are tools that can be reset or reconstructed anyway. This stands in stark contrast to the protagonists, at least most of them. After they re-enter the simulation after the five-year time skip at the end, they express joy at seeing a lot of the AI characters, like Miwako or even Wajima. Regardless of whether they're real humans or data on a server, they still have meaningful relationships with the protagonists, to the point that they're working on building human bodies for them to inhabit in the game's ending. The protagonists love these characters so much that they're willing to bring them into the real world. And if you're wondering how that's so different from Ida's methods, I think the difference lies in intent. Ida tries to do the same thing with a dead Kisaragi from a previous loop, trying to upload her reconstructed consciousness into an android body. However, I think Ida does what he does out of a sense of ownership, something he thinks he's entitled to. While the protagonists want to share their accomplishments with the people they know and love, Ida wants to bring Kisaragi back out of a selfish desire for her. So why then give him what he wants at the end? 13 Sentinels has an all's well that ends well sort of ending, where everyone still alive at the end more or less gets what they want. And after years of being trapped and toyed with by Tetsuya Ida over and over again, Inaba wants... to remain with him? Like a lot of other ideas in this game, I have complicated feelings about all this. As someone who has broken out of an abusive relationship cycle, a part of me wants to scream at Inaba to get the hell away from Ida and save herself. If Ida has done all of this to be with Kisaragi again, what's to stop him from being just as possessive when he reunites with her? I have seen Ida at his worst, and it is terrifying. But at the same time, forgiveness is something that is subjective, and I can't rightfully look at another person's relationship and assume that I know what's best for them. And if Ida beams himself up into the satellite with Inaba and lives out the rest of his digital days alone up there, what harm could he bring to anyone else? And if both of them are happy with that, or at least claim to be, what's to stop them? I mean, I can't. They're fictional characters owned by a giant corporation, and I'm not but a fan complaining about a fictional romantic pairing on the internet. And Inaba is not the only Tomi Kisaragi in the game. A different one watches her home get destroyed and becomes a cunning and inquisitive pilot who breaks free with the rest of the protagonists. And she winds up in a much healthier relationship with more personal agency allowed to both herself and to Ogata. Still, I can't help but feel frustrated that while the vast majority of characters in this game get to break free from their virtual cage, Inaba remains trapped, in part by choice, in the one her lover has built for her. For a long time, I was trapped in a cage just like that. Breaking free was one of the best things I've ever done for myself. It was a cage that was, at once, both comfortable and terrifying, cozy and self-destructive, loving and disparaging. It hurts to look at other people, fictional or otherwise, trapped in similar situations, thinking they must be happy in them. Because I did. I was told that I was happy in that situation, and my battered and gaslit brain believed it. I'm gonna give 13 Sentinels some credit that I'm not entirely sure it deserves. It understands that, to many, existence in these kinds of virtual prisons is subjective. Some people enjoy a cozy existence like the one Karabe leads, one dominated by entertainment and pop discussions. That one I can't even complain about since I've made an entire YouTube channel for that specific purpose. Even though the protagonists break free, they still return to the simulation because they enjoy it. They enjoy the AI characters who live there. They enjoy the facsimile of high school life. They reminisce on how they used to look and used to act with fun, joyful nostalgia. And that doesn't stop them from achieving a form of stability for the human race on the new Earth. Hell, there's even a fourth area full of missions for the destruction part of the game that just exist for their own sake. They're just there for those who like the RTS parts of the game. I suppose that even with my own misgivings about the game's story, I can't help but admire how it captures the weird, subjective, and sometimes scary aspects of what makes humanity… well, humanity.